Here's a secret about service. In the process of doing for others, I became enriched myself. Through service, I found my power. People might look at me today, a military veteran, a U.S. Senator, and think that I was born brave and bold. But I didn't come to it naturally. I understand from my own experience that even strong women like me can have a hard time learning to appreciate their worth. When I was a young woman, I might have been brave enough to castrate hogs. But there were times in my life when it was hard for me to simply stand up for myself. Serving in the military showed me I was capable of personal fortitude, and that allowed me to be a strong advocate for others. Welcome to Glorious Professionals, episode 20. I'm Jason here with Emily. Our guest today is Senator Joni Ernst of the great state of Iowa. She grew up on a farm in Red Oak, Iowa, later enrolled in ROTC while at Iowa State University, and served 23 years in the Army Reserves and Iowa National Guard, including a deployment in 2003 to Iraq and Kuwait before retiring as a lieutenant colonel in 2015. Senator Ernst is the first woman to represent Iowa in Congress and the first female combat veteran elected to the United States Senate. She's the recently published author of Daughter of the Heartland, and her daughter, Libby, is currently a cadet at West Point, making the senator and all of us proud. Senator Ernst, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much, Jason and Emily. I'm glad to be with you. You grew up on a farm in Red Oak, Iowa, population 5,742. Now, before we get to your military service, I would love for you to tell us how your experience as a farmer in Southwest Iowa took you to the Ukraine in 1989 during the Cold War. Yes. Um, I, so I, I did grow up on a very small family farm in Montgomery County, Iowa, went to school actually in a small community called Stanton, a population of about 700 people. But we all grew up on farms or engaged in rural activities. And just having that experience, working hard with my hands um, and on a farm, it led me to an opportunity to engage in an agricultural exchange in college. So while I was at Iowa State University between my freshman and sophomore year, I went with other Iowa young people and stayed on a collective farm in Ukraine. We were working on that farm. The family I lived with did not have a refrigerator. They didn't have running water. They didn't have a car. Um, They were still using horses and wagons to farm and such a stark contrast between the Soviet Union, which is what it was at that time, and the United States. And both of them were world superpowers. So it was just so odd to me. Well, at least one of us was. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so advan- so many advantages in the United States. And so when we came together in the evening on that collective farm, we would visit with the community members. And that first evening, we all got together. The first question that was asked of us students from Iowa was, what is it like to be an American? And it really just emphasized something that I already knew, that we live in the greatest nation on the face of the planet. And the advantages that we have here in the United States come from innovation and working hard. And we're not limited by our government on what we can do and achieve. And so when I returned to Iowa State University, I decided, you know, I love my country. I don't want to take these values and freedoms for granted anymore. And I decided the best way for me to give back was to join the military. So it seemed like that was a a catalyst for you, though. I mean, it had really nothing to do with the military to go on a, you know, an exchange (laughs) to the Ukraine. And yet service became kind of what was inspired for you. It was. And oddly enough, the organization that was sponsoring this agricultural exchange was the Iowa Peace Institute. That's great. <laughs> yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. It is ironic. Um, but I think I believe in, in Reagan's philosophy of peace through strength. And I be- believe because of that exchange, you know, it really did drive me towards um, keeping peace here in the United States by having strong leaders in the military 
I think it's so important. And I wish more young folks would recognize what a great country we have. Well, I think there's a call to to get out and see more of the world, to to cross sort of lines, if you will. I mean, going to the Ukraine in 1989 was not something that most people were doing. And it's it's really clear from your story that that was a, a, a catalyst for huge change that would lead you to the military. It could lead other people down other paths of community service or the Peace Corps or take your pick. But mm-hmm. To unlock service seemed like a great thing that it did for you. And now your, your path was to go down the route in, in the military. So, you know, I, I know you had a deployment in, in 2003, mostly in Kuwait, some time in Iraq. It was obviously that's when the invasion was. What was that like in terms of where you'd come from to then where you found yourself? Well, at that time, of course, it was very chaotic. I was a young company commander uh, deployed with the Iowa Army National Guard. And through the deployment, we were handed off. I think we served under five different commands while we were there, really just kind of pushed from one unit to the next, providing transportation support, providing force protection support. And it it really was an honor to serve, and it was very chaotic. But the lessons that I learned and took out of that experience have led me, um, of course, into into politics, but also provided me with an opportunity to see what what difficult and challenging times really look like, and how I can compare what I saw on the on the ground in Kuwait and Iraq with what I see on the ground here in the United States Senate. So so what would you say those lessons are? Well, I number one, you have to assume prudent risk. And that's a, a lesson that I've lived by uh, nearly entire my entire life. But understanding what those challenges are, understanding the way around those challenges, and finding our way to an objective. And just an an example, um, you know, on my first convoy into Iraq from Kuwait, my unit did not have maps. Um, at that time, most units did not have maps. Uh, so what I did, I went to a Tennessee National Guard transportation unit that had already traveled up into Iraq, and they provided me a copy of their hand-drawn map. And I copied it down by hand, and we, uh, each one of us, down to our squad leaders, copied that by hand. And that's what we used going to, into Iraq. You know, was it risky? Sure, it was risky. But we had to know our destination and how to get there, and I apply that to the summit today, assuming that risk. Sometimes we don't have all the answers. We don't have all the specifics. But if we have a goal, we'll keep driving towards it, you know, assuming that risk. Um, because we want to do it for the good of the organization. Yeah, there's no perfect intelligence out there or, or a perfect map. And so you take what you get to to get the job done. Yeah, absolutely, Emily. You just have to find a way forward and make it happen. I mean, I'll tell you, when I when I was over in, in Iraq in 2007, we we did have maps and it was it was also chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> so there's exactly <laughs> there's always room for adaptation and and sort of Believing in the mission, trusting your folks on the ground and, and doing the best yes. that you can for, for the people to your left and the people to your right. Exactly. In reading your book, I, I really love the part about your culture shock coming home because I found it so relatable um, and, and that you wanted Pizza Hut um, um, above anything else. And then when you saw all your stuff, you said, why do we need all this stuff and reacted that way? T- tell us about coming home. Yeah, so it was such a blessing. Uh, the the unit we spent fourteen months mobilized. A year of that, of course, overseas and and coming home after living out of uh, you know a couple of duffel bags for an entire year, you know, on a cot in a tent. You're so used to living in a in a very minimalist way, and then you get home, and everything seemed like excess. You know, you you learn to survive without a lot of the extras in life. And when I came home, it it really was a shock to my system. You know, of course, living in a a big three-bedroom house and 
you know, stereo and, and TVs and so much of that we lived without. Um, most of the time, again, living in a tent or sleeping on the hood of a Humvee or, you know, for my guys and gals, sleeping on the back of a truck. You know, that's how we learn to live. And so even the most simple things became a joy, I guess, in getting to know like Pizza Hut again. <laughs> we didn't have that opportunity in theater uh, just to grab some fast food or something. And and so, yeah, you know, it just taught me appreciate the little things in life and some of the excesses we really can do without. The part in your book that I was the most, I got teared up a little bit when you started talking about the the knock at the door that that you had to provide once you'd already come home with Joseph Millage. Can you tell us about that experience? Yes. Uh, it was a Friday at noon, and I remember it, you know, like it was yesterday. I was uh, eating with a group of friends at one of our local Chinese restaurants over the noon hour, and I got a call from the Iowa Army National Guard, and they were very apologetic, and they said, we don't have anyone else that can do this job. We, you know, right now we really need you to go visit this mother. And it broke my heart because it was a death notification of a young sergeant from Glenwood, Iowa, that had been killed in Iraq. And so I, of course, was not going to say no. Uh, thank heavens my dress uniform <laughs> was at home and ready to go. Um, so I called my deputy auditor uh, down to the courthouse and said, Ted, I won't be coming back this afternoon. I've got to go do something for the guard. And he was a retired guard member, and he knew exactly what that meant. Um, so I met the chaplain in Glenwood, and we pr proceeded on to Carla Millage's home. And, you know, every step I took towards that door, it just felt like lead, lead feet. Uh, it was something I didn't want to do, but I'd been charged with doing. And the look on her face when she opened the door, it was heartbreaking. And you're given a script as a notification officer, and you have to read that script twice by the letter of every single word. And she was falling apart in front of me. And all I could do was stand there and read that script. And then afterwards, the chaplain and I went inside with her, and I sat on the couch with her and cried. And when she was able to get back up, uh, she immediately took me over to this buffet where there were pictures of her son. And when he was a little kid, and she was telling me stories about Joseph's young son, who I think at that time was maybe a year old. And it was just I, I believe it to be the, the most horrible experience I've been through my, in my life. Um, it was necessary that I do it, but the horrible experience for me will never, ever reach the level of pain that that mother went through. Yeah, that's, that's, that's just really, you know, hard to hear at any time and, and hear you recount it. You do remember it like it was yesterday. And yeah. I really appreciated the person riding alongside with you afterwards commented on how you waited and with that mother and, and listened to the stories and the photos. And, and I think that's just, that's just a beautiful thing to share with someone in that very intimate moment. Yeah. I, uh, as a mom, I think many of us appreciate the pain that a parent would go through in losing a child, especially so suddenly, you know, the risk is there, it's inherent, but, but you just, pray that it is never affecting your family. Absolutely. And, you know, it's been many years since that time, but, you know, our nation was, has been through a lot of tough times over the years. And, you know, that's not unlike what we're going through today. And tell us what, what's going on with you and, and how are you, um, you know, working in Washington and thinking about all these uh, coronavirus and quarantines and an election year coming up and now, you know, we're having civil unrest for, um, you know, what, what's going on in your mind and, and what's the call to service now? The call to service for me, first and foremost, is still the recognition that we live in the best 
country on the face of the planet. And we need to continually remind ourselves of that, that we don't live in an oppressed country. We don't live in abject poverty. Um, we still have ways to find ourselves through these challenges, whether it's innovation or through the various programs we've passed through the Senate and the House and signed by the president. There are so many things that we can do to be supportive of one another, whether um, it's COVID funding, um, whether it is finding that vaccination here in this great country, um, whether it's coming together to uh, cry for the family of George Floyd. You know, so many issues we really need to pull together on, but recognizing still that in spite of the difficulties and the challenges we face, this is still the most sought after country in the world. Every day we have individuals in oppressed nations that want to come to our shores because of the opportunities and advantages we do offer. And I just think we need to remember that through any hardship we experience, that we still provide opportunity. And you know, it's just something that gets overlooked during these times. And we've just always got to remember that. I agree with you. It's, it, perspective is, is absolutely vital. And, and yet, as, as we look at people on the ground in a lot of, basically every city in, in our country, I mean, what's the correct response? Like, what should people be doing to unify, to unify around this idea, this dream of, of America? What should we be doing? Because there's obviously a lot of, of activity going on, but a lot of people want to help more. And w what are we missing? I think the first step for many of us, and, and certainly for me, because I'm not a person of color, so I, I don't maybe understand some of the situations that some of my friends have been through. And so I think the first thing for any of us to do would be simply to listen. It's our job to listen right now, because we don't know the answers right now. Some of us don't understand the challenges right now. And we were given two ears for a reason. And so for those that have gone through significant challenges and significant loss, it's up to us just to listen. Let's sit here and listen. And after we've listened, maybe then we come together, we formulate a plan on how we move forward to make our country even stronger. That's what we should do. You know, and for those that, that do have injustices that have been done upon them or their families, let's let them speak. Let's let them speak in a peaceful manner. You know, rioting and, and violence is never acceptable. But certainly there are a lot of wonderful folks that want to do this peacefully and they want to express their concerns. And those of us that haven't been in those shoes, we should open our ears and our hearts and, and hear them out. I think that's a great message. And I think it can be applied to a lot of different places. I agree. Senator, your daughter Libby is a cadet at West Point. What is that like as a mom? What, what do you think she's learned from your service? I think she has seen that here's a mom that can have a civilian career. Here's a mom that can wear the nation's uniform and spend time away from her family because it's necessary for our nation and our state. And here's a mom that can serve her community and do the right thing because there are others that can't. I like to think that, you know, my daughter is serving because it's something that I did. But certainly for others that choose to serve their communities in a different way, you know, we should be thanking them too. There are lots of ways to provide service out there. Not all of them happen when you're in uniform. You know, it can be as simple as being a Sunday school teacher or reading a child a book at the local library or donating blood. You know, whatever it is, we can all find ways to serve. And I hope that our next generation will see that there is opportunity to give back, regardless of what circumstance you come from and regardless of what your goal is, you can still serve your communities. So I think important in that is that we, we glorify those who serve. That's, that's really the, the heart of the matter is that we, we provide social value to those who, who assume positions of leadership. And this is regardless of, of politics at all, right? I mean, your, your daughter is, is at West Point. 
that's that's awesome. And it gives us a lot of hope for the next generation. I mean, when, when kids are willing to sacrifice personal comforts, and frankly, right now, you see it on the streets in lots of big cities, but you also see it in service academies. You see it in all, all sorts of different professions. And so what's your advice to the next generation, the, our nation's youth, right, on why they should serve? They should serve because we have a nation worth serving. And we have been provided such incredible opportunity by the mere fact that we are American citizens. There are no, no limits to our possibilities other than our own skills and abilities. And so I'd like it, you know, if everyone could recognize the differences in all of the countries around the globe and that we are provided such tremendous opportunity while others don't have that opportunity. And that's why so often, whether it's science and technology, whether it is national defense, there are so many other countries that turn to the United States as a leader. And so in whatever capacity our young men and women can serve this great country, I would encourage that because we are a nation worth serving. Senator, thank you so much for your time today. And um, it's been an honor to chat with you. God bless you both. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Senator. It was a pleasure. All right, fast and furious. The senator is back at work in Washington. What do you think, Em? Well, first thing is you always ask somebody how much time they have because you just never know, especially someone who's very busy like a senator. And I'm glad you asked because 20 minutes goes by very fast and, and was, you know, we had a lot more questions to ask Senator Ernst, but you know, we got we got to the heart of it. That's a good that's a good life tip. Yeah. So the other side of this is you know, we're very comfortable having politicians on this podcast. I just want to get that out there and say, this is not a political podcast. This is apolitical. And, and we, we took it from the vantage point of her service. And now, more than ever, potentially in, in my lifetime, there's this call to have conversations that, that cut across lines, right? Let's, let's cross some lines. So whether you're a Republican or you're a Democrat or whatever political party you are, I think there's a lot of value in listening to someone's story and in, in listening to their perspective and how they, how they got it throughout the course of their life. And so with hers, she has a long life of, of service, and we were happy and proud to, to chat with her about that. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, it's so easy to see caricatures of people in the media, and and Senator Ernst talks about this in her book. Um, but every person has a story and a background, and and all these experiences experiences that made them themselves, you know, today. And it's really important to take the time to talk to people and and give them a chance to to tell their stories. Yeah, to to sit down and ask them, what was your life like? And this is something that I've just really enjoyed throughout the course of my life. I got, I got to hear a lot from my grandparents when I was growing up about what it was like for them to grow up. And then they would, they would show me what that was like. You know, it was like you, you open up the fridge door and the first thing my grandfather would say is shut the fridge door, make your decision before you open up the fridge. And the point, the point is, is that that's how he grew up. And, you know, it made a lot of the other stories in his life make sense. Not all of his positions that I ever agree with or whatever, right? That, that's true of, of any two human beings. And, and yet, civil discourse is a really important thing. How interesting is it that as a young woman, Senator Ernst, when she was in college, just ha- kind of haphazardly went on this trip to the Ukraine, and it ended up shaping the course of her life. A lot of different sa- stages of public service. She came back, she joined the ROTC, she spent time in the National Guard, she served in women crisis centers and abuse centers, and she worked in veteran transition offices, and then, you know, eventually to the, the state Senate after working in the county, and, and now she's, she's a senator. A lot of sexy work, like <laughs> auditor of Montgomery County for six years. Yeah, and, you know, working in 
you know, these crisis centers and unemployment offices, you know, that's, that's in the trenches kind of work that I respect. On, on any side. Yeah. And, and so look, we've been in the business of building bridges since go has been around, right? The first bridge was between the military and civilian worlds. And it's always comfortable for us in some ways to have people on who share military service. There's also a lot of people that don't have military service, including my, my wife right here, Emily. And, you know, they have different kinds of service that we, that we seek to build into that, that bridge as well. So what, and, and just to add on to that, what's important is that service inspires service. And you see this directly with the Senator and, and now her daughter and, and the words she used, they're not empty. She's actually done these things and she's inspiring people to, one, acknowledge that we live in a great nation of diversity and freedom. And yes, there's things to still work on and we need to listen and, and learn how to grow. And, you know, this is something that we can all take to heart and, and apply. And a lot of times it starts one conversation at a time. It's, it's, it's very easy to get out there and get your keyboard ninja on, right? Your thumb ninja. You see, what's going to happen on this post is we're going to post this, that we had this conversation. And what's going to happen is a lot of attacks because the senator is a Republican. It would be the same from the other side if it were a different senator that, that were a Democrat. And I'm fine to sort of cut through all of that nonsense with the type of conversation that that we've had today. Civil discourse is vital to to the strength of our country and our community and we're happy to have we're happy and proud to have people of all different backgrounds come on to Glorious Professionals to talk about how they're serving the greater good, how they grew up, what led them to a life of service, what what influenced their perspective. And so, you know, I, I've talked a lot about how 9-11 changed my life. That was a, a very seminal moment in our country and one that I hope we don't repeat. Now, with the senator, it seems like her trip to the Ukraine was, was a catalyst. Service does beget more service. And so the more that we, we open up our, our brain housing group and, and let let other stuff in it that is full of diversity. And diversity is defined lots of different ways, but it's, it's getting out of our, our comfort zones of just exactly what we know. And so we're trying to push that boundary a little bit. We hope you've gotten something out of this, uh, this chat we've had with the good Senator. And we thank you for listening and for your time.